and welcome to our third episode of uh, the Revel Model Kit News. This is the September 2024 issue. And yeah, we, we, we try something new again uh, because uh, this is all a work in progress here, uh, this the show. I'm joined by Luke again. Hi, Luke. Hi. And uh, we have several guests on the show as well. Uh, some colleagues of us uh, that are going to, to join in. Uh, later on with their product categories and uh, as you can see in a second as you can see here uh, we have even more products uh, in September than uh, in the last two episodes so we have a lot to talk about um, but I would like to start with some feedback and some comments from uh, last week's show yeah, so I would like to start with some comments from last month's show. The first one uh, you see up here in the right is that Rivel hoodie available that uh, Luke you were in the last uh, in the last episode. So I think we have to talk to Stefan about that, right? Yeah, uh, not at the moment, not not available to to everyone at the moment. But uh, yeah, one of the uh, the first thing I was given when I joined the company was was that hoodie. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's enough for everyone in the company at the moment, so uh, there'll be a while till they're publicly available, if ever. If, uh, I want one too. <laughs> it's just, it's... Now that uh, Bob Fred said it, uh, I remember. Hey, maybe I should get one too uh, for next next time. Yeah, mm, and another one which I marked in blue here is uh, about the license plates. And that uh, Revel Germany and Italieri are getting something wrong about UK license plates. Do you know anything about that? Uh, it's uh, the the order of the of the letters and uh, the age of the car. There's some similarity in there. Maybe when a car gets a license plate, then the the letters have to be in a certain number. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't know the specifics, but I could tell you if a UK number plate was formatted wrong just through being from there. Uh, so it's something that I'll uh, I'll look into. Uh, obviously, I deal with the aircraft mainly, but uh, I'll, I'll speak to the team and, and see what we're doing. Uh, it's an easy fix. So, um, yes, we'll, we'll see what's happening. Yeah, maybe maybe we could do a segment uh, later in the year about license plates because I have a joke about a license plate this time again, like last uh, episode, uh, because German license plates are somewhat cryptic, but also sometimes they speak and sometimes they are really telling stories about the owners of the car or the region they are coming from. So uh, maybe we could make this a topic in, in one of the next episodes. And then Charlie asked about uh, now you are in the uh, in, in another <laughs> office uh, and you have a, a BF one hundred nine behind you. But uh, uh, he asked if that was a Robert Taylor print behind you in the last episode. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I'm in the German office and not in my home office where that print is. But um, it's not a Robert Taylor that was behind me last episode. It was a Melvin Buckley. I believe that's right. Yeah, the piece is called Angels on Our Shoulders. Um, and I think I've had it since I was about 10. I got given it as a birthday gift, which tells you uh, where my interests lay from a very early age. Uh, and I've had it ever since. Uh, it's a lovely print. Uh, and, and I believe Charlie goes on to say he's got some Robert Taylors signed by Alf Galland and uh, John Johnson, which is quite special. Cool. And then we have uh, some more here. Um, one is, uh, yeah, we, we, should, we should think about bringing back the old monogram slot cars and combine them with the Carrera chassis. Uh, maybe we have to talk about our Carrera colleagues uh, about that. It sounds really interesting. Uh, yeah. It's always nice what the community, especially on YouTube, comes, comes up uh, with, with ideas. Definitely. Uh, it's just uh, sometimes uh, easier said than done is, mm -hmm. is maybe the phrase that goes alongside it. But it's it's always worth putting the ideas out there and we'll see if we can do them. And it's like you model builders, you can go first. So uh, you can build some, some uh, prototypes or some uh, really individual, unique uh, pieces. And yeah, maybe maybe there's something possible there. Yeah. Uh, and then I was really glad it touched my heart that uh, some people say, hey, your English is OK. We can understand you. Uh, this is uh, there were several comments like that that made me really happy. <laughs> Michael from <laughs> Oregon here uh, said, OK, thanks for doing this in English. So now 
more people uh, can can understand and can uh, listen to the episodes. And uh, yeah, Throttle Power said it's a great time to be a modeler. So I think we can just uh, agree on that. Well, maybe Michael was saying that my English was good. Uh, maybe he thought I was German uh, speaking mm, okay. really, really good English. Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so my English is a lot better than any German I know. So uh... <laughs> ah, we will get you there. We will get yeah. you there. You you get some proper East Westphalian slang. <laughs> it's like the what one of one of the most important things is uh, that like in Northern Germany people say Moin for like good day or hello, <laughs> uh, and in the region uh, Revel uh, is located, they just say Tach. Okay, right. Which is I've a, not heard that. It's which which is a really short form of guten Tag, good day, <laughs> and Tag is uh yeah it 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 sounds a little bit harsh, but that's most people here would uh, would say. And Moin is Moin is included uh, or it, it's sneaked into uh, the slang here as well. Uh, okay, right. Yeah, not something I knew. I've been uh, the only bit of culture I've managed to absorb so far was uh, the Hereford beer. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been sampling that every time I come over. It's very yeah. nice. Yeah, it's quite nice. Yeah, uh, Felsenkeller, Felsenkeller Brauerei, right uh, near near Bünde. So you brought us uh, one. I would all, all, almost say a, a little sneak peek again uh, about the Gloucester Meteor, right? Yes, yeah. So as we record this, um, we're putting out a, a post today um, detailing it. Obviously, that will be in the past for anyone viewing this now. Um, but essentially, a, a long time ago, we announced a Gloucester Meteor F3, um, a 30-second scale, that is. Uh, and for a long time, uh, the project stalled, in all honesty. Uh, there were a lot of issues going on, but um, one of the, the first things that was discussed with me and the team was uh, we need to get the project back on uh, back on the go and uh, the question of were we doing the right version came up uh, and uh, because we'd announced it so long ago um, we'd had a lot of feedback which is which is good um, from from models and it allowed us to make the, the decision to change the version um, so uh, we'll be uh, releasing instead of the F3 we'll be doing a uh, 8 um as the the basis uh for for this model mm -hmm. um so we've been uh looking at doing the f8 and fr9 uh and, and maybe some more in the future uh the first step was to obviously establish how many models we can get out of that that tooling um i won't tell you that but uh <laughs> we've done some work on it and uh then uh start doing the research finding uh aircraft to scan so that we have the basis for for CAD to, to begin. Uh, so we've been around the country uh, looking at various different aircraft. Uh, there's a blog post that goes alongside this uh, that details us visiting places such as Newark to look at their FR9. That's, that's one uh, here, which right? is the cam yes, that one there, which is the camera nosed variant of the F8. Um, um, I said it in the blog, but uh, if you know anything about meteors uh, and, and ones that survive in museums, you'll know that the one at Newark isn't totally original to an FR9. It was used for VTOL trials. Um, so there's a big air, air intake on the back uh, behind the cockpit and uh, some different mods. But uh, we'll just be looking at the nose for this part. So you'll you'll see a focus on that, but also the, the drop tank that was on there that we uh, hadn't got from any of the other scans. Mm -hmm. uh, and also on there is uh, images of the, the RAF Museum, which was our next visit after Newark. Um, whereby we scans the the prone meteor, which if you know about meteors is really really exciting. Um, it's a it's a great looking thing, mm -hmm. really quite odd. Um, uh, it's, so it's just a slide before, sorry, Alex. Um, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is uh, the so the image there you see is the part of the tail. So the meteor was separated into parts. It was ready to be moved to, to Newark, ironically, uh, would have saved us a journey. But um, you'll see it was really crowded in there and we were trying to scan all the component parts. The reason we were scanning the prone meteor um, was unfortunately not to create a model of the prone meteor, but was to get the, the various parts on it that may be unique or quite rare. So uh, in the case of 
this meteor, it was the ailerons were the early sort. Uh, so the F8 had two different types of ailerons, mm. uh, and we wanted to make sure we had a scan of both just to be to be sure. So that's the bottom left image. Uh, they had two types of air intakes as well. So we wanted to make sure we weren't just guessing at the shape. Um, we could have scanned one and then. Uh, made the second one wider and just adjusted it by eye but it's always good to have something to verify the the CAD data and and the subjective subjectivity that comes in when you're designing on CAD and looking at images mm. uh, and also um the the nose as well which is again separated off um which gave us the early canopy a bit like the ailerons there were two types of ca canopy uh, early and a late version um so we we want to make sure we're covering covering that as well um after the RAF Museum, uh, we also went down to the Jet Age Museum uh, at Staverton uh, and scanned what will be the basis for, the, for the, the very start of this project, which is the F8 that uh, you see on the left there, um, the whole airframe, rather than component parts as we did at the RAF Museum. Uh, and that will allow us to create what we call a skeleton model um, right. that is basically the, the bare bones, the, the outlines of, of the, the aircraft. Uh, and that has started now, which is good. And we're, we're on the way with the CAD. Um, so at the moment, all these, uh, what look like digitally rendered images are 3D scan data. So mm -hmm. I should iterate that, I should emphasize, sorry, that they aren't uh, CAD data just yet. Uh, but also you see that we've scanned multiple different parts again. Uh, so a Derwent engine uh, that obviously powered the Meteor. So that the hope is that we'll be showing uh, uh, at least one engine um, so that you can display it either in the aircraft with panels off or uh, on a stand, as you see with a the scan there, or possibly two, depending on part count and budgets and all sorts of boring things, but more information to follow soon. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, you'll see a cockpit there um, scanned, which is actually from an F3, if my memory serves right, uh, just as a bit of a nod towards where the project started and where it's where it's come from. It helped that it was right next to the, the F8 that we were scanning. Um, and on the right there, you also see another part of our RAS museum scan uh, showing the central wing section and the top of the fuel tank. Mm -hmm. uh, and this this will be invaluable when it comes to briefing the designer, but also for my own understanding of the aircraft to make sure we're mirroring how the real aircraft is assembled because it's quite modular um, and uh, getting a better understanding of what's inside. So we can hopefully add a bit of that detail rather than just being a sort of surface level model. We can have a bit of internal detail that might not even be seen, but something for the model is a bit of a treat. Um, so, so yeah, the, this is us essentially informing everyone that we've changed version and that we're trying to show some pictures to show progress. You know, something is moving along. Yes. Yeah, nice. Uh, is there already a date, uh, the uh, delivery date on the horizon or is it open? Uh, I'll, I'll keep it close to my chest for now, uh, mm. but next year, say 2025, um, those who know about modeling will know that uh, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Uh, and we can't confirm anything too soon um so don't expect it to arrive in january is all i say um uh, but we are working our our damnedest to to make sure it gets there yeah. next year nice yeah thanks for that and uh you just, sure. just came on uh the the studio uh, when we were talking good morning jürgen hi so jürgen uh, joined us today uh for the car products and uh, the star wars products then yeah luke has to uh, travel home to england today so it was just a quick stop here uh, at the model kit news thank you yeah just a flying visit pardon the pun so hey, uh, yeah. see you later <laughs> bye bye so then we can switch over to the golf mark one convertible convertible is correct yes um yeah in the 15 years um uh, that's the time when the original car came out in 1974 um it was following to the vw beetle and it was totally different uh, when it came to the engine it was not located at the rear it was at the front um the totally round shape of the beetle uh, didn't show up on the golf which was far more edgy um, so, uh, appearance was totally different, uh, technique was different, one was uh, air-cooled, the next one was water-cooled, um, and the Golf 
had to be successful. Otherwise, Volkswagen would uh, come would have come in very very deep problems. Uh, so it was not really an experiment, oh. but it was quite risky really to focus on that Golf because you never could tell how successful it would have been. Uh, already on the market for 50 years and now already in the eighth generation. So it was really a successful story. But it gives you maybe an an impression how important the Golf was at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Golf 1 was designed by Jodaro, right? Yes. Mm. Uh, external expertise is not correct, but somebody a little bit in, uh, dependent from Volkswagen uh, to not really mm. limit it to, to specific ideas, to work a little bit free and also get the general new taste in design when it came to cars, which uh, was more on the edgy style yeah. at that time. Uh, I, I remember that we called this Erdbeer Körbchen. Yeah, it is correct. Yes. Back then, every, every, it's, it's like strawberry, a little strawberry basket. Uh, yeah. It was called in, in German Erdbeer Körbchen because it had this grip. Was a feature in, uh, in the middle. On the B column, just in case yeah, uh, it would sort of have an extra engine and flip around. So all the um, heads yeah. of the driver, co driver, uh, let's say the passengers were protected. So there was a kind of, yeah, a group like formed part in the B column, so behind the driver, co-driver area. And that was, a, as you said, the grip for the basket, for the strawberry basket. It was a yeah. reason for the nickname. And in the, in the 80s, it was quite famous because of, uh, do you still remember Schwarzwald Clinic? I remember it. Uh, the TV I didn't series? See it that often, but of course, whenever it appeared in the TV series, of course, it was very good to, to become more, more popular and famous. Uh, it was also used and in the uh, US, um, let's say, detective series called Remington Steel. So it made it also. Yes, right, Laura Hall. Yeah, so it made it also popular Laura in the USA as well. Yeah, but Laura Holt always used the car door, and when I remembered uh, the Schwarzwald Clinic TV series, uh, the guy who drove the car, he was like a really fancy, hip, cool doctor back then, uh, and he never used the door, he always jumped, jumped in, in and out the car, and he always stepped on the on the side of the door, and there are funny compilations on YouTube, if you uh, search on YouTube for Schwarzwald Clinic and Golf, you find uh, the actor Sascha Hehn, who uh, later became the German version, or uh, the German version voice of Shrek uh, in the Shrek movies he he uh, was the voice oh, actor okay. for Shrek and uh, when he was young he was jumping in and out the, uh, the golf convertible uh, in, in, the, in the TV series so that's always burned into my mind when <laughs> I see that car but it's really beautiful I still think it's a completely timeless design and it's uh, just a very beautiful car yeah, um, it's, uh, it, uh, of course, it's uh, when you bring it out or let's say present it on market, you ne never can tell how well liked it will be or not. It's always a little bit uh, trial and testing. Um, and mm. uh, the complete fate of Volkswagen, more or less, was related to the car. So uh, it had to be successful, but you, there was no guarantee behind it. So, uh, but it has been proven wow. that it was uh, the correct choice and the correct appearance for that time and for that audience at that time. Yeah. And maybe you can tell us a little bit <clears throat> about the uh, about the model. First of all, um, we had shown uh, in a former picture that the roof is folded open. And now we can let us see that we have a second option inside, so you can get it also with a roof, closed roof. Uh, whatever you would prefer and like to take. Around the car itself, the original one is from the 1970s, uh, but the tool we made out of it is uh, about 10 years old. And we scanned mm -hmm. the original car at that time, so we had the chance to create our CD material on our, um, yeah, our own way, because at the time, original cars uh, were produced on CD. Uh, therefore, it's a big advantage to uh, be able to work quite precisely and bring the parts very exact and detailed um, compared to the original uh, down to a 1 to 24 scale and uh, matching the fitting of parts to each other quite good, actually. 
And I see two interesting uh, details here. First, the model builder who, who built this car, he uh, put the side window a little bit down. So it can, let's say, uh, bring in a complete, I'll say, closed window or an open one. That's an option in, uh, in the mm -hmm. frames. Um, so whatever you would like, you can assemble in the way you would want to have it. Okay, so did he cut the uh, the window? No, 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 no. The window is on, once uh, produced completely, so uh, filling up the complete open area. And there's a second part inside the frame, nice, which is a little bit shorter and yeah. represents um, the way how it looks like when it's uh, pulled down on the original car. So it represents really one to one cool. what you have on the original. Yeah, and the other thing is. A detail on the decal of the license plate. Uh, I haven't seen that much seasonal license plates on Revell models, right? Because uh, I think only Germans would, would recognize this. But here you see that there's a little uh, 04 and uh, a dash and 09, which means that this car is only allowed to drive in the months between April to September, which is a seasonal license plate yeah. in, in Germany. Yeah, and it's you just, pay less, uh, less, less tax. And yeah. Uh, we have some options included, so you have a chance to bring your an elderly one, a modern one, or a neutral one. Then, of course, different uh, number of plates for uh, one for uh, UK, one for Italy, the next one for uh, Belgium, Netherlands, and so on. So there are different options of uh, number plates uh, which one can choose from. And so the model mm -hmm. one in this case was a seasonal one, just to, um, yeah, to have a little bit different appearance, not always the same. It's really realistic. I think a lot of, especially those cars, uh, are now uh, driven around with seasonal uh, license plates because uh, people don't want to, to drive around them in, in winter time. Exactly. They get really muddy. Um, and otherwise, and, it would yeah. face a, quite a bigger risk of uh, getting rusty. And therefore, it's mainly driven yeah. in the, let's say, warmest period of time in the year. Yeah. So, next time we have the next picture, we have the interior. Uh, and my first question here is um, this really iconic uh, design of the interior and the seats and the, the side panels. Uh, are those decals or uh, how did they did you manage to, to put those in? When you have a look on the upholstery, upholstery of the seats, uh, this kind of uh, carol like shade that is a decal, yeah. But it was uh, uh -huh. authentic, was typical for the time, and therefore we decided uh, yeah. to realize it in a similar color as you have seen it on the original one. Um, mm -hmm. and of course, we paid attention to the correct steering wheel, um, correct uh, gear shift, correct seats. So, um, it was important for us to consider the typical size of a cabrio which in some cases differ to mm. a closed car so the limousine has a little bit yeah. different appearance and i remember a friend of mine he drove almost exactly this one uh, but he had the gti version and the one he had was a uh, um, he had uh, five gears Uh, but the fifth gear was uh, was uh, installed. Um, uh, also it, it was it was uh, installed after the completion of the car. So normally it would have been a four gear uh, shifting box, a gearbox, uh, and the fifth gear was uh, applied later on. Mm -hmm. It was quite rare in yeah. uh, in this in this model. Uh, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we have like, in GTE oh, this, this is version a... of the limousine. In our line, um, mm -hmm. yeah. in the current situation, uh, uh, let's say in the moment, it's a specific Pirelli version, but with the uh, normal GTI uh, also in the past in our line. Yeah. So we offer, or have been offering also the famous GTI. Yeah, and here the, the engine is, uh, was 1.6 or 1.4, what was it? Uh, I guess it was a small 1.4. And the Vata. <laughs> the Vata <laughs> battery. There's those are decals as well, right? Or, or is this it's a battery? Yeah, yeah. Decals, right? um, many times at yeah. the time it was Vata, yeah. yeah. Therefore, you yeah. can also use a decal if you do not like it, do not bring any decal on and keep the battery black. So, whatever you would like yeah. to do as a model. 
But this has been also yeah, taken from the, the original market, car, but... and therefore to make sure that the, the containers are in the correct position, in correct size, and correct location. Oh, and so much room in there. <laughs> yeah, <to work. laughs> it's yeah, a little bit <laughs> different in, in compared to modern cars. And you still have access yes. to a lot of things nowadays. It's impossible. Then we can switch uh, to the next car, which is the 1970 Shelby GT500. Also really, really beautiful car and beautiful model. Uh, and maybe we can use uh, this as a chance to talk about uh, another topic that came up in the questions. Um, and that is, why are the US models, especially the car models, in a scale of 1 to 25 and the European models in a scale of 1 to 24? And I'm pretty sure uh, you could explain our, uh, to our viewers why, yeah. why that is. Um, and basically, it has historical reasons because uh, we are calculating in meters and they are doing uh, on, on feet and inches. So it's so. Uh, just from from breaking down basically uh, mathematical issues um, usage of of inch and feet and Rebel USA focused on one to twenty five. Why not a different scale like one to twenty three um. or one to twenty two? I cannot tell. Um, it came up as a normal um, polygonal size to do one to twenty four, one to twenty five. Uh, Rebel USA. Mm -hmm. Um, always created in 1 to 25, but Monogram, also a US based company, worked in 1 to 24. So they oh, orientated okay. more to European um, dimensions. Uh, and uh, later yeah. on, uh, Revell USA had bought Monogram and uh, they still use some tools of them. And so it can be that in one cases, you have 1 to 24 scale of an American product on the box. Next time, one to twenty-five. Some people asked, like, "Oh, can you? Can't you do uh, like the all the same scale?" Uh, but I'm. I was wondering, do you really, really? How close do you have to look uh, to see a difference when you put a one to twenty-four <laughs> and one to twenty-five next to each other? Can you yeah. really see it? Um, the difference is really negligible. Um, it's not that much. We talk about uh, millimeters. Um, yeah, but of course, the modern builder knows it from the box and would like to have it all in mm. one scale. But of course, um, mm. since, um, yeah, it's been sold in USA for years and years and years in one to 25 scale, uh, the market is mm. more related to that size and therefore USA will keep it in one to 25, which of course makes sense. Mm. We in Europe wouldn't also not yeah. switch to one to 25 just for USA. So even in future, yeah. there will be the two skillets, one to 25, one to 24, but the difference itself, it's really not that much. Normally, if you do yeah, not get, I, I can't see it. If you have the information, if you do not have the information, put the cars of both scales side by side, um, you wouldn't really notice it. Yeah, that was what, what, what I would uh, expect that in a blind test or so, you yeah, wouldn't yeah. Uh, really see it. But if, of course, if you know it, then maybe you, yeah. you realize it. Okay. If you... Yeah, let's talk about the, the Shelby. What can you tell us about uh, about the, the, the model itself? The Shelby itself. Um, Shelby had a um, contract with Ford to produce, um, based on the Mustangs, um, the special Shelby versions. Uh, but that's uh, well. Uh, there was one, um, yeah, um, contract was running out, so he couldn't work in the same um, company anymore, and um, Ford no. decided to produce the Shelby's in-house in in Ford companies. So since uh, the contract for the Shelby factory um, expired, um, um, Ford was in the lead. Um, and there, but the contract to Ford also came to expire, expiring. And therefore the real Shelby was made in 1969. And there was, uh, well, a couple of them were taken into 1970s, but just have a minor distance. It's a spoiler underneath. Uh, otherwise they mm. do not differ so much from 1969 to 1970. And this one has been the last. Yeah. Shelby 
produced for and also in Ford. Then they had the, the new contracts oh. um, in the, the 2000 years. So um, that has been the last one from the 1960, uh, beginning 1970 for some decades. As far as I know, we have... there's nobody else on the market that was offering the 1970 version. So we have some really nice double pipes here yeah, on, the, on, the, on the back of the car. It's a really, really beautiful back. Um, as when you compare the uh, Chevy from 1967 or 68, you will notice that the car became longer and longer, a little bit more stretched. Uh, especially uh, in the front, it gained in some length. The the model builder really went crazy on all the on all the re realistic details, <clears throat> especially on the different tones of uh, all the the different metal parts. Yeah, it was worthwhile to you, um, give some spots on the uh, elements of the engine, but also of the gearbox and the in area. Also suspensions and uh, a different kind of uh, stabilizers. Um, yeah, uh, of the of course you can um, if you do not want to be as precise, uh, make some elements also in black. But uh, it shows quite well what you can do on a model if you want to. I'm wondering the part here that is more reddish uh, than yellow. If this is because they saved on the on the color, or if this is a special color that uh, protects the it was the, uh, meant as your protection uh, under part. It was meant as yeah. protection. Yes, yes. And then we have the really detailed interior with lots of wood in there. Wood parts are decals. Let them uh, again, it's right? Exactly. Of course, you can paint it. But then you do not have the special structure on it. Um, you could make it simply in brown, but of course, to give it a real good impression of how it really looked in the original, uh, we suggest to take the decals. Nice view and how the original car looks like. So it's not very expensive yeah. on, on one side. It also offers also for the driver itself uh, comfort, a little bit appearance comfortable design inside yes and of course the engine <laughs> that's always beautiful to look at well, here you have a very good chance to spot on every uh, bigger screw uh, really to focus on elements uh, and you can see what it, this kind of effect it has if you really paint a lot of detail and here we have the whole the whole car again yeah. And now we switch. Uh, that is something that in German we would uh, maybe call a culture shock. Uh, so we switch from the Chevy GT500 to another really, really, for a lot of people, beautiful car with a lot of lots of memories uh, and a really special car. It's the Trabant uh, 601, 60 years edition. It's uh, it was the yeah most popular and um you know most well known car in the GDR in the uh, German Democratic Republic, uh, Eastern Germany, uh, and uh, about this uh, model there are different uh, several specialties right. All uh, when it came out in 1964, that original car was uh, from the design at least uh, quite modern. Uh, it was typically to have a kind of, um, yeah, um, this kind of design. Uh, you could also find it in uh, Western Germany from some producers as well. So it was kind of state of the art appearance at that time. Um, the engine mm. was not so powerful, of course, it's a difference. And so using metal or metal parts was yeah, quite expensive. Yeah. Therefore, they had uh, yeah. to look for a kind of specific body uh, using a lot of, um, let's say, bio biological material, which was melted and heated. Um, so not, um, not not metal, but made of, let's say, uh, not really plastic, but it was uh, hardly any metal. Um, simply mm. too expensive for production. And you can see the end here, it wasn't the biggest one, but totally enough for the car. And it was a two-stroke engine, right? Yeah. It was a two-stroke engine. And yeah, and I remember that uh, the nickname of the car 
uh, because of the the component of the body uh, also was a uh, Rennpappe. Exactly. Like r racing cardboard. If you if you translate, it would be a racing cardboard because uh, if you knock on it, uh, you. Uh, we just went to Berlin this uh, summer in the German spy museum, and uh, there they had uh, yeah. Uh, a Trabant uh, fully equipped, equipped with, with uh, spy technology, like with infrared um, uh, infrared lights in the door so that you could uh, look through walls and, and things like that. And it was crazy what they uh, got into those cars uh, technology-wise mm -hmm. back then also. And when you um, press on the body, uh, you will notice it. Mm -hmm. Signs down a bit, but if you remove your hands again, it goes back automatically, automatically in the former shape. So um, that it was quite robust, um, and uh, yeah. it was quite uh, well enough protected. So if you let uh, maybe um, uh, I would say uh, dive against a wall or so, you could see, of course, some scratches, but it was still stable. So it itself wasn't, well, the material for the body wasn't that bad at all. Um, but of course, it was no yeah. metal. Oh. And what I mean, what most international viewers maybe won't know is you waited like years to get one of those cars. It, it wasn't that you go, went into a dealership and said, oh, I would like to have a car. And you get it like two or three months later. Uh, I, I knew that some people ordered the car for their child when it was born so that like 16 years later they could get one exactly it was some cases not in the beginning it was a little bit better but later on you had to wait for yeah. about 15 years until you get uh, a car like this i was a production yeah. issue um and it, yeah, there so was, was really some intentions people. to change the shape to modernize the car which was stopped by the mm. uh, government because everything should appear the same. In the communistic uh, mm. society, uh, it wasn't so well liked to have different kind of appearances or to say, mine is better one, it should be all the same. Therefore, the shape was kept until yeah. the 1990s. Yeah. Otherwise, it's quite nice. I mean, I drove differently later on. Mm. Maybe, yes. And I think it, it still looks really timeless and, and really nice. It reminds me of a uh, of the the old Austin Mini, uh, especially the, the the front. If you just look at the front, it resembles a, a Mini quite uh, quite well. And I I totally like the design. Never drove a Trabi myself. I just uh, took a ride in it as a passenger. But uh, I, I really would like to try out one. And of course, due to the engine, and sound was very typical. When it came around, you oh, hear yes. it at once. Yes, yes. Um, yes. The, and the smell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, went by. it was a little bit different at the times so what you have nowadays, for sure. Um, yeah. The specific yeah. or special addition to the item is with a book. We also uh, mm -hmm. show it on the top of the box, uh, which is um, inside. Um, and it gives you a story of the original. You can see it at the bottom of the box where the book is shown. We repeat it also on the yeah, side I would zoom, of the I would... as well. I it on the ESI, so you can expect and see what will be inside when you have the yeah. space bar in hand, which is quite nice book. Um, yeah. Going back to the history of the original car, changes some pictures yeah. from the daily usage, uh, pictures and elements from the Honey Pork, um, brief information about the first Trabant model we made in the 1990s after the wall came down, and the new one which is inside, which um, was produced about 10 years ago based on scans. So far more yeah. accurate than those uh, models which came out in 1990, 91, 92. Mm -hmm. It seems to be well liked uh, to get some kind of um, the special information, the special book uh, included in the box. Alrighty, and uh, from the Trabant, <laughs> we switch again topics uh, briefly to uh, the Star Wars speeder bike, which uh, came out in April already, but it's a new tool and it's 
a really 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 cool kit uh, so we thought we uh, we feature it here as we have you uh, on as well maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, about the the speeder bike as well i started to realize the speeder bike because it came up in the mandalorian series uh which was um key scene in the uh, um, episodes in the season one when um uh, Yes. Yeah, let's say Grogo was kidnapped. Um, so there were two soldiers um, speeding up and um, hunting in person and later on uh, getting hands on Grogo. So um, we decided for um, Mandalorian because it was very successful. Fans, uh, I hope you can see it in the camera. We have also a Grogo in the back. Yeah, that's sweet. As yeah, it was in the original. You can turn the head yeah. also a little bit if you want to. But you you can also, uh, if uh, model builders want to, they can leave the bag and grow go out yeah. and build just uh, the, the bike with the rider? Exactly. So it's up to the person um, what he really wants to have or not. Um, yeah. yeah. So once with the Rogo figure, once without. Yeah, and Grogu was so is it the same uh, model of speed? Uh, is it is it the the same model of speeder bike as in episode six uh, on Endor, the chase where Luke and Leia uh, are chasing the other oh. two troopers, mm -hmm. or is it uh, a slightly different model? They are very similar, but there have there are some differences, just a few ones, but it's mm -hmm. not the same. If you close your eyes, you could say, yeah, oh, you take it. For Ender, but uh, actually, it, it wouldn't be correct. It wouldn't be correct. Okay, okay, yeah. So the hard, the hardcore fans would still uh, see the differences. Yeah, yeah. So of course, they are really, really, really cool uh, is, details. Yeah, it's so um, well liked and so popular. We have been decided to bring out vehicles from Mandalore, and we already released in the past the Razor Crest. Uh, with a lot of interior mm -hmm. inside, um, including the freight area, um, the place where you sleeping letters inside, also the toilet or let's say washing room, uh, the cockpits and stuff. So we had a vehicle from him, um, and beside it afterwards also, you know, N1 is Starfighter. I hope you can see it mm -hmm. here in the camera now. Yes, so we already realized the most popular and well known items from the Mandalorian, and therefore yeah. the next one, the next vehicle was Speeder Bike. Oh, sorry. And we also have uh, the the Grogu yeah. figurine, right? Yeah. Uh, which is in the in the cradle, and we have the ah, you have it there. Oh. You can see it. Yeah. It's a typical pose he has in the series. Yes. And he's floating around in his little yeah. cradle. <laughs> and of course, we have also this kind of carpet. And it's what yeah. he is normally using. Yeah. To fix yeah. it, we have a stand below, which you go in on that. Yeah. It's, it's consisting. Um, of, of two parts, so you can raise it a little bit higher on the stand or a bit more down, depending on what you want. But at least we yeah. have also... And the the, the, st it's a, and the stand is transparent, right? So that yeah, yeah. it's almost... Uh, so it, it, the base like, as well. it looks almost like it's floating. Yeah, yeah. 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 And when you put it on the stand, it's then, of course, a little bit flexible. And just feel it appear in seconds. Move. Yeah, it's a little bit of rocking motion in there, yeah. But it was, uh, well, it was important for us not to show the main vehicles, but realize also the main characters. We're from the level even bigger scale. And of course, the Mandalorian, also a typical scene from season one. Yes. Turn also the yeah, little bit really, yeah. 
That looks really cool. <laughs> YVF uh, also considered the display scene around it. Uh, that's also a little bit related to the contract with um, this uh, Alice Lucas film. Um, so we cannot show the fear alone. It must be connected with some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exterior components may be a shrimp or cradle, or in this case, a display. Yeah. But you can yeah. um, realize a lot of the main figures, a lot of the main vehicles from Mandalorian, and bring those series into your own living room. Easy to yeah. assemble. Cool. Uh, partly to click, but um, suggested to be glued. Uh, yeah, and of course, we get the CD material from. Disney Lucas film, therefore quite precise. Yeah. I have one question uh, about the speeder bike. The yeah. package says it's level three. Yeah. It's level three and I mean, yeah, the uh, the, the, the arms here and uh, are looking, the, the whole model looks so detailed. Um, is it hard to put together? No. Or is it no. really no. that that easy for beginners yeah. as well? Yeah. It looks so complex. Yeah. Well, you have to remove the parts um, clearly and exactly out of the frame. Um, um, so you really yeah. need a cutter to get them out of the frame. But the yeah. rest of it, the parts, a little bit can be snapped, but should be glued. Otherwise, it's mm -hmm. a little bit too, too loose. But the assembly, it's quite okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. We focused and on since they are the gray and black. Pardon me? The, the different parts they are already white and gray and and black, so uh, you have the the basic colors uh, already in the parts, uh, and then uh, the the builders only have to to paint like the details here in the uh, on the cockpit, for example. Yeah. So. Um, Yeah. It's not that hard to paint. Yeah, the basic idea was what we really focused on is that it wasn't uh, so difficult to assemble, so not difficult even for a beginner who is not so familiar to model building. And the uh, second uh, idea was to have the basic parts in the uh, colors, as you mentioned. So uh, if someone does not like to paint every part, there's no need to, and he still gets a quite good result. Uh, awesome. Using paint, you can put more detail and uh, bring out elements a little bit better. Um, yeah, gives a little bit better impression, but you can get a good result yeah. already without uh, painting every point or every part. And you see how precise it is, uh, how well it's matching to the, ori let's say, original figures. Um, it was important also for us and um, our focus was uh, what is interesting for the Star Wars fan and can they realize a good result even uh, without knowing much about model building um, and that was the yeah. key points when developing speeder bike as well as the yeah. N1 Starfighter for example or Google. And I always think that everything related to Star Wars is always like going full circle because uh, George Lucas and his team, when they started with Star Wars, they used old model kits and bashed them and built their their spaceships uh, and, and all the models uh, in the movie from scrap parts they had lying around. Um, and yeah, now like, this this mastery of model building in the movies uh, and that uh, Industrial Light and Magic like, started... Uh, it all comes back into uh, our kits that are uh, really easy to put together uh, for for starters who would like to get into the game of model building. So it's always full circle for me uh, thinking about that. Yeah, in 1967, when they were bringing out the first movie, they took um, different kind of model kits from Japanese producers, but also from the Rizal and brought up some parts on the typical models like Falcon or Star Destroyer or whatever. So they used real model kits mm. partly. And now we come back here and it's, yeah, bring out Star Wars and model kits. So mm. it's the opposite way. Um, mm. Or let's say the story class. You yeah. Thanks, Jürgen, for all the information on all those cars and Star Wars kits. And uh, looking forward to talk to you uh, maybe already in the next episode. Well, thanks a lot for your time and of course your patience. I mean, I mean, yeah.
talk to you again on the next meeting. Alrighty. Bye bye. Okay. Okay, so I am joined by today. Maybe you could tell us what are you doing at Revel and which are your product categories and what are we talking about today? Um, and I'm responsible for um, uh, the model kits uh, of the areas, uh, military vehicles, uh, ships, boats, and uh, figurines. And uh, since 2021, so before uh, I was working for the uh, department and before I was a trainee for two years at Revel and uh, start at Revel and uh, now seven years later at Revel. Seven years. Wow. Yeah, that's also already a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the legendary Bismarck was uh, initially developed as a, a secret project. Uh, I found out, and not here at Revel, but the, the original, <laughs> in, in 1936, Germany began the construction of the ship, uh, and that was a violation of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, this, this treaty limited the size uh, and the power of German naval vessels, and the, back then the uh, Kriegsmarine uh, kept mm. the true specifications of the Bismarck hidden from international community and uh, when it launched in 1939 it was actually about 15,000 tons heavier than uh, official claimed uh, and allowed. It was the uh, one of the largest uh, ships ever built by European marine crafts uh, and I think it was the the biggest, largest warship Germany has ever built with over 50,000 tons when it was fully loaded. Had a crew of 2,000 to 2,200 uh, men in 12 divisions. And it had a really, really short career. So it uh, we only conducted uh, a one-day offensive operation uh, before uh, it was sunk by the Royal Navy. Uh, but they had to... It was really difficult to sink. Uh, I yeah. read it. Uh, it needed hours uh, of uh, shots and bombardment because it was constructed uh, in such a robust way. Funny thing: the the wreck was rediscovered in 1989 by an ocean oceanographer, Robert Ballard, who was the same guy who also uh, rediscovered the Titanic. A lucky guy. Yeah. Really. Yeah. But also, it's also a beautiful model, and it has so much potential as a as a model ship. Maybe yeah. you can tell us a little bit about the model and our model kit of the Bismarck. Say that um, symbol of uh, German naval power, so uh, on for its power, uh, size, and armor, and the speed. So uh, we took great history, a beautiful and large model set with a special box design, with a special artwork, and um, yeah, deliver it as, as a gift set. So uh, you have the um, six basic colors for uh, this ship, mm -hmm. and uh, you have high quality decals, and two ships. Both are the Bismarck, but in two different scales. So we see the big one is in scale uh, one to 700, and yes. the smaller one is, uh, is a ship in scale uh, 1 to 1,200. Very good looking product, uh, highlights a Bismarck, you have a gift set, and it's a very, very good uh, bundle for a very good price. One could also give one away, for example, so you can, you can build both of them. And then if somebody says, well, that's a cool ship, then you can say, hey, yeah, yeah, you can have the little one if you want to. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah. So you have uh, both, uh, both scales. So uh, how do they differ? I see uh, on the on the little one. Yeah, the rump is not that deep. Yeah, right. So uh, the uh, smaller one is not so high detailed like the the bigger one in scale one to seven hundred. Uh, mm -hmm. You have much more parts, uh, um, a much more detailed base. The um, the deck is more detailed. You have more smaller parts, and um, in this scale one to two hundred, you have uh, less parts. So uh, 
we have uh, tried to build up the details on bigger parts to create a better and simpler uh, s simple um, model kit in, in a scale 1 to 200. So okay. uh, the detail is, is uh, different. Uh, are they both on the same skill level? Which, which skill level is it uh, for which model? The gift set is in full gift set is uh, a level four gift set. So because mm -hmm. we uh, we we sell both in one box. To be honest, the uh, larger one in scale one to two hundred is more a level three ship than that the Bismarck in one to uh, seven hundred. But you have um, for both ships um, to mix colors to. Uh, mm -hmm to uh, catch the uh, yeah the, the right color code for mm -hmm. the ship so uh, we said both are level four but it's uh, simpler to build the smaller one for both we have a separate uh, instruction sheet so you have can build uh, the first Bismarck ship and then the second one mm -hmm. to uh, to uh, separate both uh, from together so if anyone built only the one to seven hundred and the one to two hundred for uh yeah for a smaller brother or uh, a sister uh, you can share it so you have uh, two different uh, building instructions and maybe you can just build it together with like your grandson or your 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 kids uh, with like the dads build the big ship and the kids can build uh, the smaller ship yeah. along the could be a really nice project that uh, parents or grandparents can do together with their with the kids. Okay, cool. So then we have the next highlight, which is even level up in detail. Oh, it's yeah. the platinum, the platinum oh, yeah. uh, kit of the submarine. We had the Type Nine C submarine. Um, uh, the different version in our first episode uh, where Luke was talking about, but this is something something special, I would say. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about this uh, about this uh, model kit. It's 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 a very big model kit, so uh, Type Nine uh, submarine. Yeah, it, it was it was uh, the especially this one, the U five hundred five. It was captured by the U.S. Navy. Uh, on fifth, fourth uh, of June in nineteen forty-four, just two days before D-Day, and um, it uh, was the first enemy warship that was captured by the U.S. Navy on the high seas since the war in eighteen hundred twelve. Mm -hmm. uh, is what what uh, the the research said. The U five hundred like an intelligence gold mine since uh, it had two Enigma machines on board and the cold books. So this allowed the allies, uh, the allied cold breakers to read U-boat signals uh, almost as fast as the Germans themselves uh, back then. So they had a significant advantage through capturing the U-505 in the Battle of Atlantic. Uh, it's a yeah, very big history. Uh for uh, long-range missions. It's a very famous uh, German uh, submarine from the World War II. And uh, our kit is in scale 1 to 72. And the kit um, has a size of over one meter, so it's, it's a very, <laughs> very, very big submarine uh, model kit. Yeah. Uh, we <clears throat> we uh, cooperate with one of the best uh, developers and producers of uh, photo-edged parts. Uh, for for this exclusive um, uh, platinum edition, so uh, it contains um, the basic model kit in scale one to seventy two, and we have add um, high quality photo edge parts, uh, high quality wooden parts. So I have here some uh, from from this. So you see, nice. very yeah. very small and high detail parts some uh, wooden parts for the deck and for yeah. other details um, 3d parts printed um, add in a separate uh, detailed manual for extra parts so um, yeah this set is perfect for model builders who um, uh, they are model to be uh, 
realistic as possible and detailed as possible. The you have seen it uh, on on in the sheet. We we have a very fine details. Uh, they are more durable uh, as plastic parts and have uh, and give a better structure. Mm-hmm. So, um, but of course, uh, it takes uh, more time and skill to build. But um, after that, you have a um, much more higher quality model, and it's a big advantage for uh, such large models to uh, have this option with photo edge parts and uh, wooden parts it's a, so that makes it level five yeah i'm pretty course, sure yeah, right? yeah, it's yeah, for yeah. really advanced model builders to put together because of course the, the photo edge parts and the wood parts are expensive so there's not that much room for for errors uh, when you when you build it no so of course uh, we don't earn more money with uh, a platinum set, so it the price is higher. So uh, the pr- yeah. for edge parts and wooden parts is uh, it's uh, it's it's expensive. So uh, it's in it's in fan model. So if you uh, want to have a very nice big model and you want to uh, to uh, take time for a model like that. Uh, it's a perfect kit for for the model builder. And, I mean, the dark, the winter time is coming again. The, the right. longer evenings and the longer nights are coming back again. So it's a perfect, perfect project uh, yeah. for 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 this for this winter time. And exactly, you could you could also, if you really want to, you could also buy two of them. Because I found out when I when I researched the ship that <clears throat> to maintain secrecy about the capture, the American the U.S. Navy they disguised the U-505 as a U.S. submarine, and they gave it the name USS Nemo, mm. and then it was brought to the to the naval base in Bermuda. So maybe somebody would like to build both of the versions, like the U.S. version in air quotes and the original version as well. I could imagine uh, you could build really, really cool uh, dioramas with it, yeah, for example. Yeah, 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 big dioramas, yeah. And big dioramas, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, then we are at our third and last ship for this episode, and it's... I really like this one. It's oh yeah. I don't know. Kriegsfisch. It's the Kriegsfish Kutter or KFK. It's it's a really special concept uh, of the of the Kriegsmarine. Yeah, back in Second World War. Mm. Because uh, yeah, they they designed those ships in 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 the mid thirties and mid nineteen hundred thirties. Um, and the German Marine adapted the civilian design uh, for military use, um, and they created a really versatile small warship. Uh, and in 1942, the Navy ordered over 1,000. They ordered 1,072 of these uh, cutters, uh, and that make, made it the largest shipbuilding series in German uh, in German maritime history ever. It's, mm. uh, the, the, largest number and they were built all over Europe. Like They were built in 42 shipyards across seven European countries. Uh, it was really, really widespread and inter- interestingly um, shipyards in neutral Sweden, for example, mm. they unknowingly produced this warships because the orders were disguised as normal fishing ships uh, or fishing fishing boats placed by the Ministry of Food after the German Ministry of Food. So, yeah, they they were supporting as a neutral country the German Kriegsmarine without knowing it. Yeah. Uh, and the, the largest uh, shipyard, uh, the largest number of ships produced in one shipyard was uh, 411 ships that were built uh, at the Ernst Burmester Schiffswerft KG in Swinemünde Ost. And whoever has 600,000 K to spend, 
is still there's still some yachts that are based on these kutas. Uh, I found one mm. uh, that is sold in uh, in Thailand right now. Um, a yacht that was based on a 1944 uh, KFK. Maybe maybe I can um, maybe I can put the picture in here. Uh, I have to see if yeah. I can. Uh, maybe I just yeah, put please, a screenshot please. from the from the website in here. How it's, they how they came up with very important. Those. Yeah. Yeah, very important for the uh for the German uh, Kriegsmarine and uh yeah, very wide use so for military missions or um for logistic support. So, um we have um here uh, create a very good kit with uh uh with a very new and uh simple instruction sheet in in our kit to uh different versions in detail uh, you will uh, ah. yeah you will have uh, two options uh, from our decal sheet uh, mm -hmm. first option is the coastline of Norway and the second one is the uh, Bay of Biscay so um, it's a simple kit but uh, you have uh, mixed colors too so because of that, uh, I said, um, let us uh, make it level four because uh, you want to get the right shade uh, of the, um, of the uh, color. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, that might be tricky for beginners, but uh, if, if anyone want to uh, build this kit and is a beginner and said, okay, I'm willing to try it to mix colors. Um, I say to him, okay, try it, build it. It's not hard to build and the res result mm -hmm. is uh, very good. A little bit over a hundred parts. So it's not that yeah. many, that many parts. Um, and you could put it together as a, as a beginner. And then, yeah, the, the, the paint scheme could be altered as well so of course if you want to have a really uh, historically correct paint scheme then it's more of a level four if you say okay i really yeah. like those 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 little boat um then it's quite yeah. easy to build I, I would say i want only to build the bay of biscay because uh, this version don't have to mix colors for the right shade so okay or a simpler, yeah, it's it's more a simpler, uh, but mm. uh, for the first one, uh, the uh, coast Norway version, you have to mix colors. And this that we are looking at is the coastline of Norway, right? Oh. Yeah, right. Since it was built in such a high, uh, in in such high numbers, it's also a product or a kit that you could buy multiple times and. Like build it from the northern versions uh, down uh, to the more Mediterranean Sea versions, for example. Okay, yeah. So then we had three ships. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the the first episode uh, where we have the most the most ships yet. Yeah. So so is there anything to add to the to the KFK here that we didn't? talked about yet no, the display stand of course the 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 display stand there uh, yeah for for model builders it's uh we have uh some parts these are uh, three parts three or four parts to build up a good stand to it's a good model to uh, uh on the table on the desk the kfk okay Cool. Then I would say uh, thanks for being on your first model kit news show here uh, at Revel Yep. And uh, thank you. Until next time, maybe all, already next month, or I think uh, in the latest we we see each other again in the November episode. Alrighty. Yeah. All right. Oh. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye.